sure most of you know Pastor Bob Martin by now. He actually, we were comparing notes this morning. He actually was under Pastor Callahan in 1979. And got his start under him. And uh, it was 79 through 86, 87, 87, eight years there. And then took a break until about 2000. Uh, pastoring and doing his own thing. Out of order whatsoever. I mean, totally. <laughs> And God had him reconnect with us in 2000. So he's actually been with Pastor Callahan 28 years. I've been with him 35 years. <laughs> 34 years. I win. <laughs> a man of God, an apostle in his own right in Illinois, connecting the churches together there. And uh, so would you stand on your feet and welcome the man of God this morning? <clears throat> Amen. Yeah, it's on. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, technically, <clears throat> technically, I've been with Pastor Kyle since 79 because even though he was here and we were there, we were still always together. So, <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I, you know, um, before I get into my message, um, John 12, uh, 24 says this, most, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. First time I ever saw that verse was in, uh, I think it was 1982. When was the first time I ever saw it? First time it really hit me. It was in 1982, 81, 80, somewhere around there. When Keith Green passed away. And uh, it was one of those moments in my young walk with God and I said, why him? Why? He is doing so much. And then Melody Green brought this scripture out, and it made sense to me. Well, that's where we're at today. Because all of us in our minds could say, why Pastor Callahan? Why now? Why him? But right now, the anointing that was on his life now spreads out through the ministry. Today's a new day for Grace Fellowship Ministries as a whole. It's a new day for every pastor in the pulpit. We're not at our home pulpit, but my son is preaching this morning, and I'm sure things are going to be well there. But every pulpit that has been connected to Pastor Callahan for all these years is different as of today. It's more anointed. Because where we always were, so was he, but now even more so. Um, I've done a lot of uh, <clears throat> funerals in my time of being in, in ministry. I've done my dad's funeral my father and mother-in-law's funeral, and, and a couple of my very closest friends. But what Pastor Jack and Pastor Jim and Pastor Sherry are about to endeavor tomorrow, <clears throat> excuse me, will be the hardest point of ministry that they've ever been in. And so Pastor Jack and, and uh, Patty, I want you to come up. Pastor Nancy, uh, Robert, uh, Pastor, Pastor uh, Rebecca, yeah. Oh, she's in the bathroom. Okay, well, we'll give her a moment then. Um, go ahead. Yeah, just a minute. Let me, let me you know, um, ministry, <clears throat> ministry is tough at all, a lot of times. It really, truly is. But it's one of the greatest things you can ever be involved in. Tomorrow and Tuesday, um, when I say it's going to be the toughest part of ministry, because when you, it's one thing to, do a message for someone in your church, someone that you have loved. I mean, but it's a whole different level when it's your friend. When it's, I, I, I said, I, I did my, my dad's funeral. I did my wife's mom and dad's funeral, uh, funerals. The toughest two that I've ever done in my life was my two closest friends at that time. And one of them was from high school. And uh, to get up and do those messages, it, it comes from a deeper level. Tomorrow, I would like all of you, you can't be with Pastor Jack tomorrow and Pastor Jim and Pastor Sherry, but I would really like for you to take time out tomorrow at some point in time and just spend time before God and fast and pray tomorrow for tomorrow's service. Like maybe it's your breakfast or whatever. I'm not your pastor, but I'm just asking you from ministry level that your spiritual uh, connection to your pastor is vitally important the next two your support spiritually of him the next two days would be the strongest support he'll ever ever sense in his life with you. And he has a strong sense of it from you anyway. So those, Robert, Pastor Nancy, and, and uh, 
Debbie and Pastor Rebecca, if you'll come up, and Pastor Jack and Patty will come. We're going to pray for you um, because <clears throat> I know you have, I know God's already stirred in you, Pastor Jack, what um, you're, you're, to, you're to do the next two days. I know that. He's been stirring in you all week. I've been with you all week. And, and what you um, are going to have happen the, in the next two days is going to be anointed beyond what it already is in your life. You're one of the most anointed men I've ever met in my life, but it's, come on over here, guys. And, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, you and Pastor Jim and Pastor Sherry are really going to give all of us a lot of comfort, but you're going to really just send off our pastor. So, Debbie, I want you to pray first. And then, Nancy, I want you to pray. And uh, Rebecca, I want all of us to pray, okay? And uh, you can join in with us. Father, give us strength. Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord God. We just thank you for the widows that you've released. Both of them, Lord God, yes. the sick, the, the, the small, Lord God, Lord God, we just thank you for the anointing that falls yes. off the breath, off yes. the tongue, Lord God. We thank you that... That the peace that is going to come is just going to be so amazing. Yes. It's going to uh, surpass anybody's understanding. That peace that passes all understanding will just flow freely and genuinely, Lord God. And the comfort that will be there from the from the very throne room of God, yes. the comfort that's going to fall upon that place and fall upon all of his family and all of his extended family, Lord God. We thank you. Father, we lift up Pastor Jack and Patty right now as the, yes. as the pastor of this congregation, Lord God, mm -hmm. with their people all gathered around them, yes. giving them strength, Lord God. The desire of this people and this congregation is to show their love and support of Pastor Jack as yes. he endeavors until this time. Lord God, we thank you that you're ministering to him through his people, Lord God, through the, through the congregation that he's been leading, Lord God. Father God, we just thank you so much for everything that that Pastor Callahan has instilled in Pastor Jack, Lord God. We thank you for the strength, for the wisdom. Father God, for every single aspect of the gifts that he flows in, we thank you for it, Lord God. We thank you for what Pastor Callahan instilled in him, Lord God, in every single aspect. We just praise you, and we thank you, Lord God, that, that tomorrow is going to be a celebration. Tomorrow is going to be a, a, a mighty time for the saints to just glorify you, Lord God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Jack, I hear the Lord saying unto you that there has been a new mantle released to you. The Lord says the supernatural love that I have given you knowledge of, that I have taught you of, that I have birthed within you, and you have faithfully carried over a long season, is about to come forth in the fullness of demonstration. The cry of your heart for the glory to be seen is on the horizon. Move forth, for know that in these next days that are difficult, and new and changed, I will carry you with that which you have carried for me. The time is coming forth when the fullness of what I have shown you in past, some of it has been revealed in fullness, some of it has been revealed but then withheld. The Lord says, I am taking the limits off that which I have withheld, and I am bringing you forward into a fullness of the revelation that you know is there, that you can touch now but can't fully comprehend. The Lord says, I am releasing it to you. And the Lord said, it's going to come in installments because there's going to be such a depth to it that I will have to give it to you line upon line, precept upon precept. And I will give you the ability to understand it, comprehend it, and then teach it. The Lord says, this is a new day. Arise, my son, for I am well pleased in you and I am strengthening you now even in all that you have before me. The Lord says, those things you've asked of me, those questions you've had that you've been waiting on answers, the revelation is coming. There is a thirst I am birthing within you for even more and more revelation knowledge. And the Lord says, thirst after me even more. For my son, I desire to fulfill that, to give you all that you need to know. For this is the day to know in as much as I can give you day by day to be able to walk in it and demonstrate it 
and carry it forward, says the Lord. Father, we just release this new mantle upon him in the name of Jesus. Father, we just even just give him the anointing to walk in it. We stir it up and release it within him. Father, the Lord says, the Lord says that you are a son after my own heart. Yes. And you are one who has been humble. Yes. Those very qualities that you have admired and been honorable for those that you have honored and called fathers and watched. I am stirring and releasing in you even more and more. For you truly look like your father. Bless him, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this. We stir up this anointing in Jesus' name. And we thank you for that which is coming forward in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Patty, I hear the Lord saying unto you that I have placed within you a heart of compassion that is rarely seen in this earth. The Lord says you have been a demonstration of that which your husband has taught. The Lord says, I'm calling it forward even more and more in these coming days. And the Lord says, there are going to be those that are going to come in that have been so wounded and so hurt that a hug from you will have the healing anointing in it. The Lord says, not just the healing of the hearts, but the healing of the bodies. For the Lord says, the healing ministry is well within your hands. And I'm developing that even more and more. The Lord says, word of knowledge to know even how to minister is coming in a greater fullness for you. So, Father, we just release that anointing right now in the name of Jesus. We stir up those gifts of healings in her hands. We thank you, Father, for the full impartation of that and for the blessing of her heart as well. Father, there are times when she comprehends things in the spirit that no other people see, that no other people understand. But, Father, I ask you just to bless her with a comfort of your Holy Spirit to help her carry even the weight of that burden that she brings before you in prayer, to bless her in all that she has asked. In the name of Jesus, we just release that healing anointing and that peace to her in Jesus' name as she stands as a helpmate. And the Lord says, Patty, the rewards that your husband is gaining because of all that he has done in the heavenlies, all that he's done in the churches are fully yours as well. For without you standing by his side, he would not have been able to complete the tasks he has to date and the ones that he has coming in the future. So know, my daughter, that I am well pleased in you, and I call you an honorable woman of God, one that I am delighted in and one I am well pleased in. I invite you even more and more to come into my presence for the fullness of the revelation of that which I have given you to carry, my heart and my compassion, says the Lord.
Father, and I thank you for these two. They've been very instrumental in our lives and our ministry, and I ask a, a, a double portion anointing the next few days for them, Lord God, and for the future, Lord God, for they are the future. The seed that Pastor Callahan had sowed into all of us, but especially those closest to him, the ones that he brought into a Jesus-like atmosphere, the number, the way he had spread it out, the way he had taken it, Lord God, that Pastor Jack and Patty, Pastor Jim and Elizabeth, Pastor Sherry and Bill were of the, of the select few that he built, poured his heart and his life into in his ministry. And Father, we thank you for the anointing on Pastor Jack right now, and the anointing that carries forth from this day forward, greater, as Pastor Nancy said, greater than ever before, and he's a man that can carry it, Father. We thank you that, as Pastor Rebecca said, a seamless transfer of, of uh, connections of Pastor Jim, as, as if it was just... Pastor Callahan was just looking at that other man. And we thank you for that today. We thank you for the anointing on their life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor Jack, you know, there's been some people that have come through here over the years. And I don't think that they knew <coughs> when you were called to help. So I care for them. I just didn't get called to help, you know, to serve. <laughs> and, you know, that's what Elijah did. Elijah helped people to watch. Because he was willing. And if he was praying that, I got a picture of Elijah. The one who who the fear for Elijah. The one who saw the, the you know enemies coming in. The one who did anything that needed to be done. And that's what I see with him. And I'm so encouraged by that right now. Amen. Amen. I do Amen. like that. Hey, we're on the same page. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Thank you. Thank all of you. You know, um, as I said, as Pastor Jack actually said, um, I'm doing something for only the second time in my life, so just have to bear with me, okay? I'm using my iPad to preach from. <laughs> all I have is scripture, so I... Now the notes will just go from there. I don't have any real notes other than this opening. Pastor Jack had mentioned uh, Joshua. If you would turn with me in your Bible to Joshua chapter 1. Um, I believe, as Pastor Jack believes, and he spoke it out first, but it was like it just quickened in me. We are now following Joshua. Pastor Jim, we could just switch his name and change it to Joshua because that's who he is to all of us that are in that's who he should be to all of us, but especially those in ministry that uh, continue to walk with him. In, in chapter 1 of Joshua, this is not in my message, this is just extra, okay? So I got plenty of time, right? You guys are not hungry or nothing, I can't get you hungry, right? Uh, I did that last week when I preached at Pastor David Guernsey's church to start talking about lunch, and everybody started getting antsy in their seats, so <laughs> try not to do that today. Um <laughs> Pastor Jack would just leave if I start talking about food too much. Anyway, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 says, And after the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. And that's exactly what's happened this week. Um, and uh, Moses, my servant is dead. Get going. Now, I'm reading out the message. He says, arise. And, and you spoke the word arise. My whole message today is about arising. Okay. He, said, he, told, he told Joshua, get going. Just go do what you're supposed to do now. He goes on to say this, cross the Jordan River and you and all the people cross, it, cross to the country that I'm giving to the people of Israel. Moses wasn't able to go into the promised land. He wasn't able to do that. But he said, but when God tapped Joshua, he says, now is the time. Now is the time for action and grace ministries. Now is the time for all of us, like never before, to get a hold of the giftedness that's always been there. Not one of you in here hasn't been gifted since the day you were born to do great works in the kingdom. It, uh, you know, there are certain things that we get to do as pastors. Or saying, the thing is, beloved, you have been gifted that nobody else has. You know, your giftedness is like nobody else's. Pastor Jack and I preach. I know I'm better than him, but that's okay. Uh, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to go there until he started it. I was just going to be nice and serious. What I'm saying is, is we, we all have the, we have the similar gifts, but we're not identical. 
Every one of us is called to be an evangelist. Every one of us is called to go out and win the lost. Every one of us is supposed to be doing something that has been embedded in us since the day we were born. That's what he was telling Joshua. Get going. Go do what you're supposed to do. And it's important that we get a hold of that. He goes on. Let's drop down to verse 5. It says, in all your life, no one will be able to hold out against you in the same way that I was with Moses. I will be with you, and I won't give up on you, and I won't leave you. You know, Pastor Callahan is no longer with us, but he is. I got in here this morning, and I knew he was going to be preaching, and I thought, this is the first time I'm going to be preaching without that man in my presence, whether I'm in Illinois, or I'm in Kentucky, or I'm in Ghana. You know, and, and the thing is, is it didn't matter where I was at. Pastor Callahan was with me. Well, he still is. He's at a greater level, though. I started, I don't usually get emotional uh, in, in, in funeral services or anywhere because if I've learned to not, he taught us last year. Deb and I at our kitchen table. He says, I don't grieve. The word says we're not to grieve like the world grieves. We're to rejoice. We know where he's at. That, that, that smile that Pastor uh, Jack got from him was, as I see said, it wasn't about him. Pastor Callahan saw heaven and smiled. Why? Because of the throngs that were waiting to greet him. Can you imagine the greeting he got? Seriously? I mean, this is a man that had ministered all over the world technically. He wouldn't necessarily go himself, but he's ministered all over the world. And every it's a it's a ripple effect. You know, it's 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 interesting to see. We have a, a minist- we have a mission outreach in our home church, and uh, one of the ladies in our church, they have what's called a base program, before and after school Christian experience. And the public schools send their kids to this 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 experience. And the thing is, is they've had over a thousand children. They had, what, 13 just last month? Give their lives to the Lord. What does that do? It's not just 13 kids. That's 13 families. Well, it's not just 13 families. That's just that ripple. That's like throwing that rock in the pond and watching it spread out across the pond, the ripple. That's what Pastor Callahan did. Now, he goes on, but see, that's what Pastor Jack and Pastor Jim, all of the pastors, but especially those three. Those, this should be, we have a prayer list in our book. I don't have mine with me of who we're praying for all year long. The word it says that we're supposed to pray for the leaders. Well, what are the top leaders of our prayers need to be? Pastor Jim, Pastor Jack, and Pastor Sherry. Why? Because they're leading this ministry. Every day when you go to the Lord, those three should be at the top of your list. He always is, I'm sure, but now you need to add Pastor Jim. Now you need to add Pastor Sherry if you haven't done that before. But you need to do it. Why? Because they're leading this ministry, and they need your prayers. Go on, drop down to uh, verse 6. It says, strength, courage. You're going to lead the people to inherit the land I promised to give their ancestors. Now drop down to verse 9. Haven't I commanded you strength, courage, be of good? Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God, is with you every step you make. That's what we got to remember. He's with us every step, everywhere we go, all the time. You know, and I get in the pulpit because I'm not a public person. You get me in a crowd, and if I don't know anybody, I'm pretty much a wallflower. That's the way I've always been. And when God called us into the ministry, I couldn't believe he was going to call me to preach because I didn't like being talking in front of people. And so I have to, but I have to, when I get into the pulpit, I have to know he's there with me. You know, I get in, and okay, I don't feel as prepared as I'd like to be for, for the, for the uh, preaching that day. or what, Not today, I'm just saying, I don't, and I have to remind myself, God's right here with me. He's going to let... I may, make, I, may, I may fail, but he's not going to fail the word going out to the people. They're going to walk away having been ministered to that day. But that's only why, because they come in expecting to receive. And, we, and that's the way we, we expect him to go with us everywhere we go. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says this, And they answered Joshua, Everything you commanded us will do. Wherever you send us, we'll go. We, we obeyed Moses to the letter. We'll also obey you. We just pray that God, your God, will be with you as he was with Moses. There's your prayer for Pastor Jack, Pastor Jim, and Pastor Sherry, that God will be with them. every. And I, I was with them when they made some the, the things they had to do to make sure the ministry doesn't sputter or spin, but just to keep moving forward. There will be, my guess is, a new anointing on the ministry. 
greater, not, not, not less, but greater than where Pastor Callahan has left us. Pastor Jim is a great leader, and I guarantee you God's going to speak to him in ways that he's never been spoken to before. Your pastor and Pastor Sherry are going to see things and do things. It's already happened with Pastor Jack. It's already there. Why? Because God doesn't. God wasn't caught by surprise Wednesday morning at 1236, I guess, noon. He didn't catch him by surprise that Pastor Callahan was entering the kingdom, entering heaven. He knew if that happened, when that happened, that Pastor Jim, Pastor Jack, and Pastor Sherry would carry it on a new level. And they will take us with them if we allow them. He, let me read that again. It says, they answered Joshua, everything you command us, commanded us, we'll do. Wherever you send us, we'll go. And we will obey, we obey Moses to the letter. We'll also obey you. We have to get our eyes on the new vision, on the new direction. It's not going to be something that's going to take us out of the place, but it's a place where we have to go. Amen? Will you back up? Now we turn over to, I'm going to get it now, and now I can start my message. So now you can start the clock. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 3. God called our church this year to arise to the glory year. It's a new year, right? It's a brand new opportunity. Now, um, when God gave me this message, I thought it'd be, and what, what's happened is, I've been preaching this message since the end of last year now. And it's like I can't get away from it. Sort of like when we started teaching covenant, taught it for like 26 straight weeks. And I know I have more understanding of covenant than Pastor, Pastor Jack, but I, you know, that's just, did that say that out loud again? Huh? I got all these notes. Well, we were supposed to write a book there. I said, I want to see what he had in his mind. You know, <laughs> One of these days we'll get that book written. Anyway, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 3, look at it, verses 22 through 23. <clears throat> and then the hand of the Lord was upon me there. Think about that. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me there. He's, he's in this He's in this place. And in, in chapter 3, actually, all of Ezekiel is being set up. Now, we sang that song earlier. Was that title of that one song, Rackle, Rattle? I got to have that song. I just started, I almost started crying with that song. But Ezekiel, my, one of my favorite Old Testament passages is, is in Ezekiel 37, where he's in the Valley of the Dry Bones. There's no better place to be to minister than a dry bone valley. A dry bone valley. And the thing is, is he's, he's getting the anointing here in chapter 3. He goes on to say this. He says, he said to me, arise and go out into the plain, and there I shall talk, to you, talk with you. And so I rose and went out to the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there like the glory which I saw at the river Shabar, and I fell on my face. He went where God told him to go. And the, the, the thing is, is that I know that Pastor Jack has taught a lot on the glory. So I'm really taking a step of courage even to get into that area here because of his teachings and his understanding of it. But the thing is, is that Ezekiel, God saying, go to the plain. Now, why do you have to do this? He says, he says arise and go to the plain. Why? Why do you want to, why do I got to rise and go out? Why do I got to go? That could be, that would be a lot of people say that today. Well, why do I got to go over there? One of my favorite places to go when I'm preparing a message is in, a, in a, I like coffee shops the most, but I like the noise around me. Now, if I'm at home and the noise is around me, it bothers me. <clears throat> and besides that, Debbie's like, you still, you still busy? Or she's always, you know, no, she's not. But, uh, but it's like, I saw, I, yesterday I went to a little coffee shop down in Frankfurt. And I sat, there's all kinds of noise around me. I put my ear pods in, put some music on, and just started allowing God to speak to me where, I, where he wanted me to go today, where he wants. And, and, and the thing is, is that I go there because why? It's not home. It's not a place I'm familiar with where I can get distracted. I'm not distracted by the people around me or the, the talk. That doesn't bother me. But if I'm at home, then I'll look at this book. Then I'll look at this. And then I'll look at that. I'll get up and go to the kitchen. I'll get it. You know, and the thing is, it's distracting. He says, go out to the plain, Elisha, or Ezekiel. Go out to the plain. So many times we sit and wait for God to come to us. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to go forward to him. We're supposed to step to that new level. And that's, and that's what's going on this week in Grace Ministries. We're going to step to a new level. We could, the normal way of, uh, of a loss is that we sit back, we grieve, we have sorrow, we do all this stuff back here, and we just... All, that's not what we're supposed to do, beloved. We're supposed to step up and say, okay, God, I'm ready now. That's what Joshua had to do. God says, you go, Joshua. I'm sending you. 
He goes on here, he says, two things were present in that go out to arise and go out. The first, and because and the, and, the place was different, it wasn't familiar. But yet when he got there, it was familiar. He'd already been there before. He'd already seen the things, but he was seen there already. He had already experienced the glory of God elsewhere, but it was right there. And I love the way it reads and sometimes it's, and it's, the glory was standing right there. It was waiting for him. The power of God that's in you, that's always been in you, is just standing there waiting for you to arrive. It may be today. It may be tomorrow. It may be next week. But it is waiting for you to arrive. You know, um, I'm growing my hair out, and I'm growing my beard out, much to my wife's chagrin. She doesn't like my beard long. She likes the goatee, but she doesn't like the full beard. Well, this is just the beginning stage because I'm going to look. Yeah, anybody seen the movie Christmas Carol? I mean, uh, Christmas Chronicles? Am I the only one that watches kid? Okay. Uh, I'm the only one who watches, huh? Kurt, Russ, Russ. Ru, Ru, Kurt Russell, right? Now, if you haven't seen it, watch it's, it's a It's a fun show. It's, you know. But R Kurt Russell's the Santa Claus. He's got this nice, great big beard, and he's got his hair. And I'm thinking, I could look like that. I look a lot like Kurt Russell, right? I mean, it, I could look like that, right? <laughs> With makeup? From oh, from the neck out. <laughs> what? <laughs> from the neck up? I was saying from the neck down, I look like. But I, anyway, so I'm growing this, and, and I don't even know why I went there now. I don't even, not, I'm not even sure why I told you that story. But anyway, it, you know, huh? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play Santa Claus for the bass program. And last year I did it because I, I, so I asked our bass program, I asked her, I said, Gail, well, what do you need? She said, we need Santa Claus. And from a back part of our sanctuary, a voice cried out, Pastor Bob, you could do that. <laughs> That's not what I was after that day. So I did it. I put, the wig, I put that wig on and I put that stupid fake beard on. I said, I'm not doing that next year. If I'm going to do this again, it's going to be all mine. So I'm on my, on my road to look like Kurt Russell from the head down. <laughs> that, that, that's a faith step. <laughs> well, I already got my Goldie Hawn, so I don't know. I'm good already. Uh, the, you know, so anyway, he, he, he had to, the, the, where he had to go is he had to go to a place where he could hear God. He had to be able to hear God at a level he'd never heard him before. And that was what it was all about, going to that place, arising and getting out of where you are. Getting out of that familiar territory that takes your eyes off of or it takes your eyes and ears off of listening and seeing God, what he wants you to do. And so he goes on in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23 through 22 through 23, it says this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get up, get into the boat, and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up to the mountain, and he himself prayed uh, until the evening came, and he was alone there. Why did Jesus do that? I wrote, a, I wrote an article years ago. And I think actually it's in my first book that I wrote, in my first devotional. Uh, re just put it in there, and and it was um, it was called uh, P and P. In the military, they have what when you're at war, they have what's called R and R, and I think it's rest and something. I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know. Maybe it's rest. I don't remember. So God showed me this. I'm I've had a very busy week. I'd traveled about a thousand miles, been to several prisons, just to visit, and. Uh, and, and then uh, ministered several times, and I sat down. I had to write this because the secretary said, you're not leaving the building until I get your, your, your thing for the article, the article for the newsletter. So I sat down and started writing, and it came to me, prayer and preparation. That's what Jesus did. When he was getting ready to go into something, he took time. He set himself aside. Jesus set himself aside to hear from God. And after he had spent that time alone in prayer and preparation, he was then able to go out and do what he needed to do, go out and minister. And that's what that was about there. He had set himself aside. He had sent the disciples on ahead, and he went by himself to pray and prepare. And that should be our daily event, this time of prayer and preparation. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 39 says this, And then they came to a place uh, which was the name Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, Sit here while I pray. Now, that seemed like an easy task, didn't it? But what he was asking them to do is stay here and pray with me. Be with me in prayer. Spend time. Tomorrow, you need to be in prayer. The service is at 2.30. So if I'd say from about 2.30 to 3 or 3.30, I think it has to always be an hour, right? 
I think that's what it is. It has to be out of the breath. We have, so from, well, it's from, from anywhere from 1230 when it actually starts till 4, you need to spend time in prayer. I don't care if you're at work. You can still pray. You need to be praying for your pastor. You need to be praying for Pastor Jim. You need to be praying for Pastor Terry. Why? Because that's, they're over here doing this. You need to be over here doing that. And, and he goes, and that's what he's saying. He says, verse 33 says, and he took Peter and James and John with him. That, you see what I'm talking about here about the three? Pastor Callan always put me in awe of how he, how he set up the ministry. Because he had the three. He had the, the closeness. He drew, he started to hear, and then it came out, and it came out, and it came out, and it, came, and it keeps growing. And what they've done again is they've set the example. Jesus set the, the example. Pastor Callahan followed it, and Pastor Jim is following it. He's keeping it to three, then out, then out, then out. And that's, and that's what we need to do. He goes on to say this, verse 34. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. That watch was pray. That watch is standing your post. We see it all the way through the Old Testament. The watchman was to stand and guard and watch what's coming at them. And that's that prayer area. That's that prayer area of standing and watching and seeing what's coming our way. He goes on to say then, he went a little farther and fell down on the ground and prayed uh, that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not, not what I will, but what you will. Drop on down to... Uh, well, no, we, we don't want to skip over 37. 37 says this, and he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your flesh at times is going to have say, I can't do it. Um, after my first trip to Ghana, I came back and I started exercising because I needed to lose a lot of weight. And I've I've gained some of it back again, but uh, I started walking, and we live in a, it's called a horseshoe, it's not really a circle, it's not, but it's a horseshoe, so I started walking a couple times every night, I'd go out and walk for about, I had a, I had a, a music pod that I would listen to, and as soon as that would over, I'd come back in, and then one night, Debbie says, have you ever walked down that way, which we live out in the, sort of out in the country, I said, no, but not tonight, and so I started walking, the next night, I said, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to walk down the road a ways. And pretty soon, by the end of that summer, I was walking 8 to 10 miles a day. Now, um, I did that for a long time until I ran into some health issues that I thought I can't be out there because I don't want to have, there's no restrooms out there. So, you know, so I can't be out in the daylight. And I was like, well, I need to find somewhere to knock on the door, <laughs> right? But so, so anyway, I'm going to get back at it this year. But what's got me, yeah, I, I, there is no secrets in Bob Martin. <laughs> I'll tell you whatever you need to know, especially if it's about Debbie. <laughs> Just kidding. I learned, she goes, it's like the kids go, come on, Dad, do you have to tell everything you know about us? And, and it, so anyway, I was, so I, 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 I'm, I'm going to start doing that again when we get back. The weather's breaking up, and I can get out, and because I, I don't like cold weather. And the thing is, is I, I'm going to go out and start working, but I, I got to think about how long, what, it, what it's going to take to get back to where I was. Well, that, that's, that's true about anything. You know, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want to do it, but I've got to overcome the flesh to get back to where I want to be, to get down to the weight that I want to be at, to be healthy again like I, I felt, you know. I, I mean, I died in Ghana, came back, and God restored me and did all kinds of great things to me, and then I end up, what, a couple years later, I'm back in the hospital again thinking I'm going to die again, you know. Well, I wasn't thinking I was going to die. They were telling me I was going to but uh, thing I was gonna have to have an open heart surgery, the whole thing, and I got a stent. I mean that 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 cardiologist in Alabama said you're gonna have to have either open heart surgery or the worst case scenario, a heart transplant. I'm thinking no, but no way. Because first off, I don't want to outlive my wife. I want us to go together. But I want us to go when Jesus comes back. I'm not gonna die. I already Bible says it's 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 it's, it's the band. Man is responsible to die one time. Is that what it says? I've already done that. I have to do it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Got that taken care of. The thing, the thing is, is that I expect to re, I expect to be around when Jesus returns. Ephesians chapter five, verse eight through fourteen says this: For ye are sometime, for you were sometimes darkness, but now you're the light of the Lord. 
walk as children of light. Everything that we do when we get up in the morning, everything that we do, we need to realize we're not ourselves. We're God's chosen. And in that chosen existence, we have the glory of God in us. We really don't have to go out to the plane and say it's standing there because why? It's in us. And the thing is, is that we, he, says, he, says, he says, we're the children of light. We need to realize we need to operate like that. Everything you do, every time you lay your head down at night, you need to say, you need to be able to say to yourself, I had a good day and I did everything that God asked me to do today. Now, okay, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to fail along the way. So I don't want you to go to bed tonight and go, well, I wish I wouldn't have heard him. <laughs> the key is, beloved, is that we, I lived ever since Ghana 2013. I have lived every day as if the potential, the last things that have come out of my mouth are the last things that ever come out of my mouth. And so I want to make sure I tell her every day, several times through the day, I love you. How are you doing? I love you. And I, and I, and I, I tell my kids, every time I get off the phone with my kids, I don't see my kids as much as I would really like, probably the way as much as they would really like, but I mean, it's not, not as much as I really like. The thing is, is that I want to tell them I love them. I want to tell my grandkids that I love them. I tease I tease my grandkids, and none of them gets, gets away with that. I have two brand-new grand, well, they're not brand-new, but a one-year-old, a little over one-year-old and one six-month-old granddaughters. They haven't felt the teasing of, past, of, of, of grandpa yet. But all the rest of them, um, I put, posted a video the other day about my second youngest granddaughter. And, uh, you know, we started out with three granddaughters, and then we hit in a streak of boys. And I told my oldest three granddaughters at one point, I said, we started weak, but we finished strong. <laughs> Every woman in this building just went, he's, I'm done listening to this guy. <laughs> but God has a sense of humor because the last two we'll ever have are girls. So we start strong and finish strong, right? In the middle, we got a gap. The thing is, is that uh, uh, the, the one, little one over one-year-old, she's starting to talk. She's, she's, she's jubbling and j- jabbering. And so I was trying to get her to say, Papa. And she just, rah, 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 rah. I said, Papa. And her older brother, who is five, Jack, he goes, uh, he goes, Papa, she has, he does, she has not to say Papa. I said, yes, she has, you say it. He, he said it, and he said, I'm not a baby. I said, you're a baby, Jack. <laughs> he says, you're a baby, Grandpa. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know why I told you that either. Um, verse 9 says, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and, r- and righteousness uh, and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruit works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We're just supposed to straighten things out, not cringe back. We live in a country right now, it's like every news bulletin is like, oh, my gosh, again? I mean, I saw where he's allowing criminals to vote now or whatever. It's like it's, there's certain aspects of life that just need to stay the same. You know? Anyway, it goes on to say, verse 11 says, have, oh, I know, verse 12, for it is a shame to speak even of those things which are done uh, of them in secret. But all things, but all things that we re- are reproved, are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth maketh man. I can't. Why am I reading King James? For whos- whatsoever doeth make manifest by light. Verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Well, wake thou that sleep. That's the church. We would not be in the state in the world, let alone our country, that we are if the church did its job. If the church wasn't asleep. I'm not talking to you guys. I know you're not asleep. But we've got to see. Can you see? They say this. What, I forget how many they say that are Christians, that they say they're Christians in America. And it can't be true. They're not living it. They may say it. But when I was a kid, I was an American. I thought, they asked me what religion are. Well, I'm American. I'm a Christian. I hadn't been in church hardly at all. I'd go on Easter and Christmas. And that's if I could get my parents up after having them have been out. Uh, party in the night before. The thing is, he says, Awake thou that sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you the light. He's already given it to us. But he said you'll be able to use it if you awake. Um, and he says, and, and, and the next thing that God told Ezekiel is, I will talk with you there. He says, go to the plain, and I'll talk with you. You know, prayer is two-way. It's one thing for us to say all we want to say and just regurgitate out everything that we've got to give him. It's like you ask my grandkids, especially, especially my grandkids. Our grandkids, uh, oldest three, we've spoiled them. My oldest granddaughter's 22. She's going to be, we haven't spoiled. I, 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 we, we, 
Shameful. We have blessed. That's an easy one. But, you know, hey. Our second oldest granddaughter, who is going to UK, or KU, I don't know. It's UK. I tried to get her to go to Louisville. She said no. <laughs> <laughs> You're a UK grad, right? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, she, she's in love. She's down here. She's forever Kentucky. But when I remember one time, it's been several years back, she goes, oh, we're going to Grandma and Grandpa's for Christmas. We all get, and they start, they, 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 they map out their territory. I'm sitting here, and they're going like this. Because they know we get at least five. They, back then, when they first started, we'd get all, they'd get all kinds of stuff. But now they get five gifts. And I said, do you guys realize why you get five gifts? Why Grandma and Grandpa have chosen number five to give every one of you. We have 14 grandchildren. That's a lot of gifts. And the thing is, I've learned as the girls and the ones got older, their gifts are a little bit more expensive, <laughs> especially girls. I mean, you could buy one little thing of makeup, and it's a thousand dollars. Can I be your granddaughter? <laughs> but she, Carly, goes, "Oh, can't we get five gifts from Grandma and Grandpa?" And they, and they pass that down to the little ones. The little ones don't know no five gifts or nothing, but they they tell them. So I said, "You know why? Because of the original five of us. We have three children in Deb." And I said, "That's to illustrate where you come from, is those five gifts." And so, anyway. Why did I tell you that? <laughs> well, the thing is, is he said, I'm going to go out and I want to talk with you. I want you to come. You already have all you need, but I want, oh, it's a two-way, the giving. That's what it is. It's, prayer's that two-way street. It's not, I need everything, I need all this. Is you go and you tell him and you pray to him, but then you sit and listen. The thing about Preparing a message is I can go through the Bible and find all kinds. Of, I could go through my old notes and find old sermons. But I want to hear what God wants to tell me to say the day I get up in front of people. I want to know, even if it's, a, even if it's, I don't do this much, but even if it's a sermon I preached before, it never comes out the same. Why? Because God's speaking to me different here. I want to hear his voice. I do counseling on the side. I, I, I don't go prepared to my counseling sessions. I don't read the file. I don't keep files, actually. All the files I have are in my head. And the thing is, is that I want God to tell me while I'm sitting in front of that person or that couple what I'm supposed to say. So I'll listen to them sometimes for 50 minutes. And God says, all right, now speak now. And here's what I want you to get back to me. Why? Because I've been listening to his voice the whole time. More so than theirs even was. He's speaking to me, and he speaks to all of us, beloved. He speaks to all of us at a level. If we're just sit back, taking that prayer, that part of the prayer time, say, "Okay, I'm, I thank you for, I thank you for the time you've given me today, God. But now I want to hear what you have to say to me. I want you to speak to me, and I want you to do it all day long. I want to hear your voice in me all day long. I want to make sure when I get to the stop sign that I turn left." Because you told me to turn left. Not just because that's the be best way to work, but because you told me to do that. I want to hear when I go to eat lunch that I, I'm getting the right. I, I, that's how intimate God should be with us. I'm not asking you to be super spiritual. I'm asking you just to hear. I'm asking you to listen. As he's telling Ezekiel, go and listen. I have something to say. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29 through 33 says this. But if henceforth... Thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Thou shalt seek him, you sh thou shalt find him. If you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when thou, that's, yeah, that's King James. And with thou, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things that have come upon you, even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall not, and shall be obedient to his voice, he says, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. Pastor Jack said something earlier that just popped in my head just now that I never met a man of mercy I come across my life. Um, he would tell you a story using somebody else as an illustration. And when he got done, you realized he was just telling you about you. But he didn't want to, he was not a man of confrontation. He was a man of great mercy. And he would tell me, and, and I remember sitting at a restaurant one time in Illinois, and he was talking about a another pastor, and I'm thinking, oh, no, man, no, no, and then at the end, God said, that was you, he was talking about you, and I said, you weren't really talking about that person, he sort of smiled, and just went on to, 
thing is, is that verse 32 says this, For ask now of the days that are past, which you were born before. Since that day God has created man on, on, upon the earth, and ask of him, and ask from the one side of heaven to the other, whether thou has been any such thing, <clears throat> any, any such great thing as this, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou heard and lived? He's talking to Moses. He's saying, Moses, remember. See, the, the thing that we all have today is to have memories of what God's done in our lives already. We have memories. How do, we know, how do I know you hear his voice? Because you heard it when he said, come to me. And that's a voice that should resonate in you every day. And you say, that's the voice I want to hear. As a believer, we shouldn't have, uh, as, a, look, as a counselor, I had a guy come in my office one time. I worked for an agency. And we get all kinds of different people. He says, I hear voices. Not, I didn't have a hard telling him. I do too. Because <laughs> I do. I hear voices. We all do. Let's be honest. We all do. But the voice we need to tune into the most I can wake up in the morning and hear a song in my head from the 60s and the 50s. Where did it come from? I have a jukebox in my brain. I understand that. <laughs> the thing is, is that it, that stuff is, but I want to be clarified. I want to get clear, clear, clarity of God's voice in my life. I want to hear it. Why? Because I heard it a long time ago. And he said, come on. I heard it at 10 in a closet in my bedroom. And he says, I'm here for you. It was 18. At 18, I said a sinner's prayer for eight years. I walked as I wanted to walk, but God was never away from me. At 27, Deb and I finally totally full-born gave our lives out to God. This is it. We're here. We're, we're forever yours. 10 to 18, 18 to 27, and the slow life thing is, is that I always knew his voice. I always heard the voice. In First John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, using the passion this time, a little bit easier to read than the King James for me. Delightfully, be uh, delightfully, be loved, <laughs> delightfully loved friends. Yes, maybe not. Uh, don't trust every spirit, but carefully examine what, they're, what they say to determine if they're of God, because there are many false prophets. You know, I have to tell you, Pastor Nancy, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I, I trust Pastor Jack, but I'm always, con I'm always, um, someone said, well, yeah, we're right on track. And I said, okay, I have to see it myself. I guess I'm a doubting Thomas, right? She came up to our place last month, maybe? Was it last month? End of January with Pastor Jack. And I know my people. I mean, I know my people well. And she didn't miss one place. Not one person, and I'm back there, and I'm back there against the wall going, oh, my. God was right on track in every one. He used her to be right on track in every one of them. And it's like she got invited back up to Illinois. You have to tell me when you're there so we can take care of everything because I'm not sure he knows how to host. We'll take, we'll take care of you. And she didn't know anybody. She didn't talk to me about anybody, and I didn't tell her about anybody. But she went boom, 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 boom. So you have to, tr you have to examine what they say. You have to trust what they say. Well, you can trust what she says because she's that accurate. God works through her mightily. Go on in ver verse 2 says, here's the test for those who with the genuine spirit of God, they will confess Christ, they will confess Jesus as Christ who has come in the flesh. Everyone who does not acknowledge Jesus is, the, is of God has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard from the, uh, which was coming and is already active in the world. The Antichrist has been around. He knows what to do. And he'll try, he's like, he's, like, he's like a ventriloquist sometimes. He tries to throw God's voice at you. And you know it's not the same, you're not, not the same tone, not the same accent. However you hear God's voice, it's not the same when he tries to throw it at you. It's different. Drop on down, um, well, I should say, and, and, and next, next thing was the glory of God stood there. He said, arise and go and listen. And, but when he got there, he was confronted with the glory of God. He was, it, it stood right there before him. The glory, by the glory of God, which is the glory that he saw at the river. He already had experienced it. He had already heard the voice of God. He had already experienced the glory, just like you. You're not any different than Ezekiel. Um, and so, 
And Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 24 through 27 says this, And the Spirit entered me and lifted me to my feet and spoke to me, Eternal one, go inside your house and shut the door behind you. Son of man, they will tie you up in ropes so that you cannot get out of the house and walk among the fellow exiles. I will stick your tongue to the roof of your mouth so that you cannot speak, warn them, because they're a rebellious, rebellious lot. Now, that always catches me in the Old Testament. God said, I'm going I'm to take care of these people. And you're not going to be able to say what you need to say to sometimes. God's got, he's got a plan. He's got a plan. You know, I'm sure there's been times where even Pastor Jack got up here and preached. Even, even the, no, I'm not going to say that. The motor mouth that he is, I can say, it just sort of fell out. <laughs> the thing is, is that I'm sure there's times when he got up here and he couldn't say what he needed to say. What he felt like he needed to say, because God said, no, don't say that right now. It's not time for that. So don't get discouraged when you, you walk away and go, oh, I want to, and I couldn't. Just realize God's got a time. He's got a time and a purpose. Just like I, I, I cried out at 10 years old from a closet in my bedroom. I didn't, I, I, I didn't get raised in a Christian home, and I didn't know where to go from that. At 18, I got saved by a Jesus freak at Steak and Shake parking lot. We were cleaning up, and I asked him, well, tell me about it. And he led me through a sinner's prayer. The very next day, I took all my tips and bought my first Bible that I still have, even though it left me for about 20 years. I got it back. It came back. It had been to Vietnam, Korea, been everywhere with me, and I got it back. And I, it doesn't, it's in my truck. It never, I, I, don't, I don't read that one but it's there to remind me of God's testament to, to me, to how he took care of me. He carried me through. I got to go to war and never fired a weapon. I don't have any scars from that. And I can, I can sometimes sit back and listen to the other guys and go, well, why, why don't I have any of those? I don't want any. You know, be real, I don't want any of that. God took care of me even when I wasn't walking with him, because he had laid his hand on me. He laid his hand on Ezekiel and said, get up. Get up and go listen. And Ezekiel got up and went. I got more, but I, I Pastor, I just really feel like I need to end it here. But I, I, I do want to say this. I don't do this a lot anymore. You know, when Pastor Callahan, our pastor in Illinois, um, every service he would end with, if you have a need, come up to the altar, and that's what Deb and I would do. We go up. I, my favorite, you listen to his stories. He used to crawl up underneath the piano when he was a little, a little boy to pray. And he said the reason why I did is because my brother did. What t- his older brother taught him a whole lot of things that carried pastor through. Well, I used to go up, and I used to be up by the grand piano. I used to sit there and pray, 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 pray. We just got a new building. The excitement of this week was sort of tempered by what would happen with Pastor Callahan. But we were... We've got about a three-quarters of a million dollar piece of property that we're buying for a dollar. Seats 150, you know, two parsonages, five acres, has its own cemetery. I know where I'm going when it's all done here. <laughs> no, it's, it'd be empty for our church. It's, oh, it's a, oh it's, I'm not telling you this. <laughs> we haven't even told our people. I'm not online anymore, I'm not, right? I am. Okay, we'll cut that part out or something. <laughs> well, all my people should be in church, so they shouldn't be hearing me, right? There, I got that covered. I told them, don't say nothing until we're back. And so I was going to do it next week. Well, I'm going to be back down here next week at, at Lexington, and uh, so I'm not going to be home. So Debbie gets to share it all. And I'm so excited. I'm so pumped. Um, the thing is, is God has a blessing for us. He has a place for us to step into a new level, a new beginning. And I'm excited about this property. I'm excited about what God's doing here. I'm excited about what he's going to be doing in Lexington and Louisville and in every other town that pastors feed the tribe. So I'm going to close. If you'd like prayer this morning, Deb and I'd like to pray with you. I know this is a praying church, and you probably don't need that today. But the thing is, is that we're always here. So I'm going to close with that, but I'm going to turn it over to you and anybody who would like to pray after you're finished, and we would like to pray with you in closing. Amen? Thank you for having us. God bless you. If you'd like Pastor Bob to pray for you, come on up here right now before we make a shift in the flow of the service. 
We're going to need prayer for healing, touch of God, devils cast out. Thank you, Jesus.